former self. This is not the PVP of Good Luck Jonathan. It's not the PVP of Obasanjo. It's not the PVP of Amadou Ali. The PVP has self-destructed. The PVP is a divided party, an evil party, a vessel of evil, which has totally and completely consumed itself. The PVP is a party which, by its own constitution, had promised to zone the presidency to the south and to have a power shift and violated that, and it's created a crisis amongst them. They couldn't even keep their word. They betrayed their own governors. After all the southern governors in this country met and agreed on a power shift, everybody went home very happy with that decision. And what happened? The PDP governors, the majority of them, except for the G5, betrayed that at the convention and shifted power and decided power should stay in the north. Whereas the APC, on the other hand, the northern governors in the APC insisted that power should shift to the south in the name of equity. And, and that's what happened. So you can see the difference between the two. The, AP, the PDP has a presidential candidate who not only betrayed the cause of the south in his party, he also insisted on not just being presidential candidate, but also insisted on having a national chairman from the north, having a DJ of his presidential campaign from the north. That is the PDP of today, not the national party of before, but a regional party that simply wants to serve the interests of one part of the country uh, at the expense of another. And that's why they're having so many difficulties. This is a, this is a party that once had Peter Obi as its running mate in 2019. And the same Peter Obi left and has now gone to the Labour Party, giving them major problems with the Southeast, which is its constituency. Those votes will be taken from the PDP, the South South, maybe a few votes in Lagos State. But the PDP has cracked. It has, it, has, it, has, it, has, it has exploded. It's not going anywhere. It's a knocked engine, and the leadership is a leadership of disaster. As for the, uh, uh, the, the Labour Party, well, I doubt they'll get 25% anywhere uh, uh, in, uh, in the South. I doubt that even in the Southeast, he'll get up to 25% in any of the states. But even assuming he does, he certainly won't get 25% in the South, in the Southwest in any of the states there, including Lagos. He might in Lagos, but I doubt it. I doubt he'll get 25% in, in, in the South-South states. I doubt he'll get up to anywhere near 10% in any. They're hoping for Plateau and Benway. I can assure you they'll probably only get about 10%, 20% in each. They will not get up to 5% in any other North-Central state. They will not get up to 2% of votes in the North, in the North, in the North, uh, in the core Northern states. That's the Northeast and the Northwest. So where will be is hoping to get votes for, I don't know. Where Atiku is hoping to get votes for, I don't know. What they're hoping and praying for and consistently say is that at the end of the day, their victory is, will be determined by one thing and one thing alone. And that is if the, Northwest, the Northwestern governors betray Tinumbu and then say that um, they're going to support him instead. Well, that's never going to happen because the Northwestern governors are men of integrity. The people of the Northwest are people of integrity. They have rejected the idea of a Fulani to Fulani succession. After eight years of Fulani man in power, you put another Fulani in power for another eight years. That would be a dangerous thing for our country and for our people, including for the Fulani themselves. And they know this, and they have rejected that idea, and they will support a national candidate, a man that believes in Nigeria, that will protect the interests of the Fulani, the Hausa, the South, the North, the Christian, and the Muslim. And that is why we have a far better chance than anybody else. So the only place they're big is on abusing people Casting aspersions on the character of our, of our candidate uh, on social media and making false claims and allegations. They're very good at that. They're very good at lying. They're very good at being deceitful. Atsuku is a man that betrayed Obasanjo when we were in power. I had, to walk, I had to attempt to walk him out of cabinet meetings on two separate occasions because of his betrayal of Obasanjo when we were in power. They're talking about the good things Obasanjo did. He did a lot of good things. But, uh, but all along, Atiku was a snake trying to destroy him all along as his vice president. Nothing could be better described as being treacherous as that. That is his nature. He did the same thing to good luck Jonathan. When Jonathan assisted him so much, he betrayed Jonathan in 2015, led five governors out of the party. There's nothing Jonathan didn't do to get him to come back. But he ensured the downfall of Jonathan, and that's how President Buhari came in as a consequence of the betrayal of, of Atiku. Uh, of Jonathan right. by Atsuku. Now, isn't it ironic, a number of years later, a number of years later, five governors have now also left him, left him in the lurch, they will never go back to him, and they have, they have also responded to him in that way, and he will now lose this election woefully. I could say so many things to you about Atsuku Abubakar and about Obi tonight, and I intend to do that, because 
The truth of the matter is that nobody likes to hear the truth in this country about what is being, uh, what these people represent. But let me tell you, what is going on is this. It's a choice between light and darkness. Ashiwaju presents the light. He is the light. Atiku is the darkness that seeks the darkness. And Obi is something that nobody seems to understand until he will get to power, God forbid. Then you know that Ipo is ruling this country. Why do I say so? Look at the emblem of his, of his beer cans. He sells beer. It is the emblem of Ipo. Why do I say so? In the southeast, when he was governor in Anambra State, no non, no non Igbo man could own a stall in any of the markets there. As for northerners and deporting uh, uh, northerners out of his state and non-northerners as well. When he was governor of, Anam uh, of, of Anambra State, he ensured that um, Pentecostal Christians could not even build churches there, only Catholics. He discriminated. When he was governor of Anambra State, bodies were floating into Oji River and allegedly as a consequence of state-sponsored terror and people were being killed by the authorities on his orders. When he was governor of Anambra State, everybody was on strike. When he was governor of Anambra Street, he was using the money, his state government money, to fund his own business. These are the things that Obi stands for. These are the things that Obi did. And that's the man that President Olusha Gwabasojo has just endorsed. It is absolutely nonsensical. Let me also add this. This is a man who has a running mate, one Dati Ahmed, who came out and said that if they were to get to power, he believes that all people that do not share his sexual views, that is to say, people that are homosexual or bisexual should be killed. That's a very serious thing to say. It's a murderous, murderous uh, agenda, which I think is absolutely horrendous and should be condemned by all. This is also a man that is so daft that he couldn't even know what he says half the time. Let me give you one example. He got on television and spoke about Margaret Thatcher, claiming that Margaret Thatcher, the former Prime Minister of the UK, ruled the country in the 50s. She was a member of the Labour Party and that she helped to establish the unions. Forgetting the fact, or not knowing, in his ignorance, that Thatcher ruled the UK in the 80s. Thatcher was a Conservative, not a Labour Party member, and, and Thatcher actually destroyed the unions and the welfare state. That's the kind of quality of people that Robert Sonjo has just endorsed, and I find that totally unacceptable and utterly disgusting. That is not what Nigeria wants. This is a man, this same Dati Ahmed, who, 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 who has done so many things and said so many things that are totally inexplicable. A man that when he was asked by Sheo Okumbaloe on, on channels television, what do you have to offer? What is your solution in terms of to fight insecurity in the land? What did he say? I will not tell you. He said it three times, but we have a plan. That is the kind of dunce. These are the kind of people that have just been endorsed to the presidency of Nigeria by somebody or by some people. That is a joke. They're not going anywhere. The candidate himself is not going anywhere. The advice is not going anywhere, and Atsuku is certainly not going anywhere either. Ashiwaju will win this election. They said he had mental problems. They went on TV. They said he's too old. They said he doesn't speak well. They said he, he, he's sick. This is a man I just saw speaking earlier on today for no less than about 30 to 40 minutes nonstop, having just come back from, 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 from out of the country and going every day from different states to different states campaigning, and you tell me that man is sick. And his speech was excellent. So I think it's enough of all these slurs that people are coming out with. Let's look at the individual's concern. Let's look at their record. Let's look at what they have achieved, and let's judge it on that. Let's stop demonizing and telling lies, and let's stick to the truth. And we will call a spade a spade, that Atiku would be a disaster for Nigeria, Obi would be a disaster for Nigeria, and the only hope that we have today is uh, Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinumbu. Is uh, endorsement. Um, Atiku is a man that is, his, his spokespeople have consistently said that uh, um, Ashiwaju is ill and so on and so forth. Yeah, this was a man that went to Chatham House not long ago and he got on the, he got on the stage and was speaking to the people there and, you know, as he was speaking, he was reading his text, reading his speech and all of a sudden he cut out, blanked out and for one full minute he was just looking at the, at the, at the speech, he couldn't say a word. And so Reno Mockery, one of his aides, got on the stage pinched him on his backside, whispered nice things into his ears, then he suddenly woke up and started speaking and reading his text again. That doesn't seem to me to be a very healthy man, but that's what Atiku did. Again, you have to ask yourself this very, very simple and yet very, very serious question. How can we take seriously a man that's been trying to be president since 1993? For the last 30 years, Atiku has been trying to be president of this country. That's his constitutional right to do so, but it's also indicative of, of an obsession 
that he has for the presidency. He wants to be president just for the sake of being president and for nothing else. He has a very feudal outlook and he believes strongly that it's just his divine right to be president, which is why each time after he loses, he goes running to Dubai to seek comfort from his friends over there. Again, I go on about Atiku. This is a man that you must ask yourself this question or ask him for us. Why is it that with all his farms, all his infrastructures, his university, and so many things that he has all over the northern part of the country, where everybody has been affected by Boko Haram and ice war, he has never been attacked, none of his institutions have ever been attacked. What is his link to those organizations? Is it true that he has such links uh, with them? And precisely what does he do for them? How come they always seem to avoid you know, conflicts with him or anything to do with him or his properties, given the fact that he has so much up there. And what is his link to Sheikh Ahmed Gumi, who is a man that has consistently defended the, the, the kidnappers and who has insisted the government should continue to pay ransoms, even if it meant them breaking central bank and giving them all the money to get our people back. Gumi's associate has just been arrested by the DSS uh, under suspicion of terrorism, and as the net gets tighter and tighter, I'm sure we'll hear more about that. But we have to ask precisely what is the relationship between Atiku and Iswap and Sheikh Gumi and the gentleman in detention and Boko Haram. I'll go on about Atiku. This is a man that when Deborah, the young lady that was martyred in Sokoto and butchered, burnt alive and cut to pieces by a raging maniacal mob, okay, they killed that woman, that young lady in cold blood, a young girl. And Atiku's aide tweeted commiserations and regrets and condemned the killing. Atiku ordered them to withdraw that condemnation, to withdraw those commiserations, and to say no, don't say a word. In other words, he basically endorsed it. And, you know, with no remorse. Now, if, that, if he did that, which is what he did, the question you need to ask is, what is the fate of Christians under such a man? Of course, he will tell you he has nothing against Christians. But the fact of the matter is that when it mattered the most, when a young Christian girl was butchered in the north, this man said nothing. Whereas the, the APC, the President Buhari, spoke for all of us when he condemned the killings and said it was the wrong thing to do. And so did uh, the Sultan of Sokoto and every other good Muslim and every other good person in this. Mexico withdrew his commiserations. And this is something that I take very personally and I hold against him. I could go on and on, you know. Atiku has so many questions to answer. What happened in the 80s? What is his relationship with, with Mr. Volpe, the Italian billionaire? What happened with the 53 suitcases uh, when, when, when he was head of customs? What really was going on? And, and, and what about um, this idea that he has, a very important one, about selling everything, selling the assets? The last time he was put in charge of privatization by President Tolusha Gombasa, between 1999 and, two, and, and 2000, uh, 2003, he tore the place apart. Now he's telling the whole world has his main campaign issue that he's going to sell everything. And of course, when he says that, you know what that means. He'll sell it to his friends, one of whom has just stolen all the, the shareholders' uh, the money in, in, in a bank that he used to own, who is the main person running the Atiku campaign, Kardi. by the way. Atiku's campaign is being run by a notorious businessman. We all know who he is. He's uh. a dangerous man. Now, this is a man that wants to privatize. And what do they do when they privatize? What do, no, let me finish, please. What do they do when they privatize? They've done it in the past. They privatize everything. They go there, they asset strip, they strip everything off, sell everything, and leave the company dead, and it never functions again. And that's what he wants to come and do all over again. He did it before, and now he wants to do it on mass scale. That is what he wants to come and do. And by the way, his, his friends in the private sector, who he's so enamored with, and who are backing him, if you go and look at the list of people that are owing at Amcon, that are actually debtors, massive and shameful and disgraceful debtors. 90% of them are Kaya Day, um, they um, We need to that, move on to, to other matters at this point. I would like you so to respond to the question I asked earlier. We need to move on to other issues at this well, point. I would like about, it to, you asked yes. Me, you asked me about, yes, you asked me about, sorry, I'm coming to that right now. And if I may, I'll touch on that now. Like I, like I told you earlier, like I told you earlier, I think it's, a, it's an unfortunate, and like I told you earlier, I think it's unfortunate and totally unacceptable for President Obasanjo to endorse a man like Peter Obi. And I've, I've given my reasons already. The, the most important thing to understand about him is that what you see is not what you get. If you put an Obi in power, you are going to put IPOB in power. If you want an Igbo president, and there's every reason that we ought to have an Igbo president, and it's, you know, we've never had one, and I'm one of those that have always supported that, then let it be that that evil president emerges from one of the more sensible parties 
like APC or, or, or any other party that's a truly national party, a president of Igbo extraction that is a Nigerian, not a president that is Igbo and is there only for the Igbos. This will be a very dangerous thing. Now, let me tell you what I find the most disturbing about this man. This is a man that has refused to condemn those that are killing and butchering innocent people, security agents, soldiers, uh, policemen, DSS uh, officers in the, in, in the East, uh, known as unknown gunmen. And when he was asked why would he condemn them, he said he won't condemn it because he doesn't know who is behind it. Well, we all know who is behind it. He knows who's behind it. They are his friends, and that's why he can't condemn them. And that is what an OB presidency would offer, more and more of such tribal, ethnic, vicious carnage and the killing of so many people that are not from that part of the country. That's not the kind of Igbo person we want. We have great Igbo material, like Umahi, Ugwai, and so many others. I could mention so many that would be great presidents at some time in the future. But right now, the issue is power shift. Not power shifting to the southeast necessarily, but power shift from the north to the southern part of the country. That's the right thing to do, the proper thing to do, and the only man in the south that can beat Atiku hands down is Ashiwaju Bola Metinumbu, which is why we're supporting him. So that endorsement that Obasanjo gave, I'm afraid, is, is very good for only one thing, and that's the dustbin. But most importantly, it's inconsequential. It goes nowhere. It will have no effect whatsoever on this, on this election or this campaign, and we shall prevail.